Duma calls for more specialist workers. Prime Minister in Hawaii for U.S. talks. And visiting New Zealand trade delegation positive. This is National MTV News with Helen Sayer. Good evening and thank you for joining me with Tuesday's news. Papua New Guinea needs more specialist workers in the oil and gas sector. Public Enterprise and State Investment Minister William Duma said PNG must create more opportunities for nationals as more projects will be developed in the country. Minister Duma made this statement while witnessing the presentation of 4.5 million kina to the Kumu Petroleum Academy today in Port Moresby. The 4.5 million funding is for the first batch of students who will undergo 24 months of training at the state-of-the-art training facility at Idubada near Port Mosby. The training is strategically to upskill nationals with relevant skills and knowledge of the oil and gas sector while achieving the overall motive of recruiting nationals in specialist areas. We will need more and more qualified and well-trained public Our own people will be able to run those operations ourselves, and you are the future. Orient Group of Companies and Site Skill Training will be spearheading this intense training. Kumul Petroleum Academy has been internationally certified and accredited to facilitate the trainings. You'll find that the training that you get will, uh, will, will give you a pathway to, to the oil and gas industry and uh, mineral and other industries as well, because it's not just oil and gas skills. We want to start off as oil and gas, but uh, you, you, can, you can branch out. Chief Secretary to Government Isaac Lupari told the pioneer students the level of certification will not only provide employment in the country, but overseas as well. The, the benefits of oil and gas industry is not only in terms of revenue to government, but in terms of skill development. By skill development, we want to see young Papua New Guineans not only working in Papua New Guinea, you can work any of the world. You're qualified to work anywhere in the world. ExxonMobil is sponsoring this first batch of 16 students out of 32. With more oil and gas projects identified in the country, a significant number of workers will be required by the sector. The Kumul Petroleum Academy hopes to produce this ration by upskilling nationals through appropriate trainings. The 16 students were chosen from over 2,000 applicants. Jack LaPave Jr., National MTV News. Prime Minister Peter O'Neill is in Hawaii representing Papua New Guinea and Pacific Island countries in discussions with the United States. Mr. O'Neill arrived in Hawaii this morning where he will chair the 10th Pacific Island Conference of Leaders or PICL which begins tomorrow. The meeting will be attended by leaders and officials from Pacific Island nations in the United States and cover a number of regional integration and cooperation issues. Prime Minister O'Neill says he expects Pacific Island nations to come out of regional discussions with the United States this week, holding a stronger collective perspective on key regional issues, including climate change and security. He says that despite the impending change in the U.S. presidency, Pacific Island nations have had a very positive relationship with U.S. President Barack Obama, and this conference will set the tone of the region's relationship with the new president. He says one important feature of the PICL is the access it provides to some of the best research scholars and policy officials in the region. While this relationship has previously covered regional safety and security, Mr. O'Neill says the international community has a number of current concerns including maritime disputes, the spread of terrorist attacks, global economic instability, and the constant threat of extreme weather caused by climate change. Neville Choi, National MTV News. A visiting trade delegation from New Zealand is in Port Moresby this week to visit business houses and facilitate trade between the two Pacific Island countries. In an exclusive interview with MTV, Chairman of the New Zealand PNG Business Council, Tamati Norman, shared the delegation's expected outcomes when establishing partnership and some of the challenges faced by council members. 
Despite a weakening Kina and a recent spurt of negative press for the country, investors are still keen as ever to invest in the country as well as form trade partnerships with business houses in Papua New Guinea. Tamati Norman, chairman of the New Zealand PNG Business Council, has led a trade delegation to Port Moresby to meet with and discuss strategies with businesses in the country. According to Mr. Norman, there is a lot of interest from businesses around New Zealand looking to expand their horizons in Papua New Guinea. We represent around $200 million in trade coming into Papua New Guinea and we represent a much lower number coming out of New, um, Papua New Guinea. Yeah. So part of where our drivers is that we want to increase trade both ways. Yeah. So that's trade coming out of Papua New Guinea into the New Zealand market and New Zealand coming into the PNG market. There are a few New Zealand companies who can boast about their endeavours in PNG, such as Hawkins New Zealand, contracted by the government to build a now iconic Kumul flyover in Port Moresby. However, businesses are keen to invest in other sectors such as agriculture. One of the first things I'm very personally passionate about is um, linking landowner groups um, with indigenous um, iwi, Māori landowner groups in New Zealand looking at how we can build um, sustainable business models together. After the success of Mapai Transport, a PNG freight services company who opened up their office in Auckland recently, the path for inclusive partnership and trade between both countries is widening and opportunities endless. Leanne Girari, National MTV News. Hela Provincial Police Commander Michael Welly says the province needs more police manpower and not a declaration of a state of emergency. This follows a string of tribal clashes in various parts of the province over the past month. Como Magarima MP Francis Potape says the SOE call will be costly. The Como Magarima MP expressed this afternoon that there is no need for a state of emergency for Hela Province. He described the announcement by Taripori MP James Marape and Koroba Kopiago MP Philip Unyalu as misleading. Therefore, we do not need a state of emergency to bring about peace. Peace is brought about by leaders, leaders who are on the ground, members of parliament who walk the ground. If there are issues on the ground, you solve it. That is your problem. He maintained that tribal zones have been identified and local MPs should ensure the district's law and order committee are in charge of the situation. If I go and solve my tribal fights in my, province, in my district, then he has to do the same thing and stay in the district and address that issue. The Como Magarima MP also called on the Prime Minister to consider his call and seek other cost-cutting measures and restore normalcy in communities. PM should not listen to leaders who are based in Mosby and making these isolated calls. SOE is not the way forward. Speaking with the Hela Provincial Police Commander this afternoon, PPC Michael Welly said police on the ground need support through manpower and logistics to deal with these issues. PPC Welly says fighting is happening in only a few hotspots and police are doing their best to maintain order. Jack LaPava, Jr. National MTV News. National MTV News continues after the break. Stay with us. Welcome back. Chuave MP Wera Mori says he has on numerous occasions raised complaints on the floor of Parliament of alleged biased and unsanctioned investigations conducted by a team of investigators led by an RPNGC chief inspector. The member has ordered for an investigation to uncover the abuse of district funds. However, he claimed the investigations were disrupted when rogue policemen attempted to arrest the investigating team. The member said the matter has been raised with Police Commissioner Gary Bucky. He had actually agreed that there will be a police team to go and investigate and complete it. In, you know, investigations that I have already, uh, that I have formally complained based on the Auditor General's report. And that the police, you know, and I'm waiting for that police you know, investigation team to go up. So while we are waiting for that team to go up, those policemen, the drug policemen who, is inv who was involved in the crime itself by you know, illegally breaking down the district treasurer office, is now going up again there and making arrests. Does he own the police force? Can someone tell me, does he own the police force? 
Bani Green MP Belden Nama today filed a motion in court to reopen the trial in his tribunal case. This will allow him to table fresh evidences in court. However, the National Court refused his application on the fact that Nama had not established a clear case for the court to grant leave. The Waigani National Court recently closed the trial into Belden Nama's tribunal case and continued with the submissions before the case ends. But Nama sought leave today to reopen the trial, telling the court he has fresh evidence to table. He also sought to have liberty to receive witness affidavits to find out if there was a breach of natural justice in appointing a tribunal. Last year, a tribunal was set up to inquire into allegations of misconduct in office. In 2012, Nama stormed into the courtroom where Chief Justice Zay Salamo India was presiding over a case. He had ordered police and soldiers to arrest Zay Salamo for interacting with Justice Nicholas Kiriwom while there were two Supreme Court references on foot to determine the legality of the then O'Neill Nama government. This case is in its final stages, and Lias Kandi, lawyer representing the second defendant, Ombudsman Commission, argued that they don't want to repeat the case, describing the evidence irrelevant. Vasenata Yama, National MTV News. The new acting administrator for Morabe province says she will focus on improving corporate governance in the Morabe administration over the next three months. Sheila Haro, a veteran public servant of 30 years, says she is confident of setting the groundwork for greater achievements. She took over from Masai and Moat, who served for the last nine months. In a small ceremony this afternoon, members of the provincial administration gathered to witness the handover takeover. Masayan Moat served as acting administrator for nine months. Today, he signed documents passing on the responsibilities to Sheila Haro, who will now act on the position of provincial administrator of Morobe. I will be traveling after the PMT meeting tomorrow. We will travel the districts. Sheila Haro was Deputy Administrator of Social Services. She played an important role in health and education developments in the Morabi province. Today, she said corporate governance will be her main focus over the next three months in the acting capacity. You know, basically, in terms of the human resource you know, management, um, uh, financial management, and executive governance, working with the uh, uh, political leaders. Morobe has seen an undercurrent of administrative instability since the exit of the recently knighted former administrator, Manasupe Zurno, who provided a long period of stability. The new appointments will seek to pave way for stability in the province. Scott Wyde, National MTV News, Lay. A report is now being finalized on the standards-based curriculum training in Lay District. The report will cover acquittals, attendance of teachers at the training, and a brief from the imparters. The report is a requirement from the nine districts in Morbe by the National Department of Education. The report is expected by the National Department of Education from all the nine districts in Morbe. The district education manager, Kamul Laga, and his officers have finalized a report for Lay District, which includes concerns raised while undergoing the training. For the basic that they receive, uh, they should not wait. They should start straight away to implementing, uh, implement the SBC. Morobe is the last of the 22 provinces to undertake the standards-based curriculum training for elementary schools due to the delay in the availability of funds. Trainings for standards-based curriculum lasted for a week in Morobe in order for the teachers to implement in elementary schools. With the concerns raised on the time frame of the SBC training, the Lay District Education Division is planning to conduct reinforcement training on SBC in the district. When the syllabus and teacher's guides comes, I, I think uh, uh, there should be fun, av funds available to do a reinforcement uh, training so that uh, teachers can actually uh, feel and see and grasp what is in the teacher's guide and syllabus. The Department of Education will soon appoint two school inspectors for each district to be able to assess and monitor the implementation of SBC 
in elementary schools. Julie Badui Owa, National MTV News, Lay. Despite a noticeable slowdown in the PNG economy, Kina Securities Limited continues to make solid progress in its business development and consolidation following last year's Maybank merger. The company has reported a net profit of 20.5 million Kina for the first six months of this year to June 30th of 2016, up 350 percent from the first half of last year. The results demonstrate a doubling in the size of the Kina business after the 349 million Kina acquisition of Maybank PNG in September last year. Now looking at our finance news, the Kina closed unchanged at 0.3155 US dollars in the interbank market. At Bank South Pacific, your Kina was buying 0.3080 US dollars, 0.4036 Australian dollars, 0.2723 Euro and 31.02 Japanese yen. Looking at commodity prices at New York close, coffee closed higher while gold, cocoa and copper closed the day lower. Palm oil and copper closed lower while crude oil closed the day higher. And on the stock market, the Dow Jones closed at 107.59 points higher, the ASX is trading at 15.58 points higher, and the All Ordinaries is trading at 18 points higher. You're with National MTV News, more local and international news when we come back. Welcome back to the news. Over 2,000 women from the United Church across the country are expected to participate in their seventh regional convention to be held in Kerama. Hela United Church Regional Women's Fellowship Team was the first to arrive in Port Moresby before traveling to Kerama. These women, many of them mothers, represented 12 seconds of the United Church in Hela province who will be participating in the convention. It has taken three days for the arrival in Port Mosby after traveling by road to Mount Agen and catching a plane here. Treasurer Ella Regional Women's Fellowship Miriam Luguni says this will be the third year of their participation after Ella became a province. This includes the church program second in Enga province. First convention, I have 50 plus mama have been come. Now long second, I have 70 mama have been come. Okay, now long third time, I have 100 plus mama have come. And this play team blow me play long uh, this play convention he been all same fear God and save him. So inside long this play ministry and me play hundred play mama he can me play represent him uh, twelve seconds inside long region uh, uh, yeah region blow me play. So he got twelve play region inside long Papua New Guinea but me play hella and one of the regions inside long uh, Papua New Guinea. I mean, lot of United Church. After previous conventions, they have recorded an increase in this year's women participation by 100. She said the previous attendance was 50 women in year 2000 recorded at the Wula Convention and 70 from the Poribada Convention in Central Province. They are part of 11 regional women representatives from all the United Church circuits across the country. National President Marama Kisagabutu says a total of over 1,000 participants from other provincial circuits have yet to arrive in Port Mosby. This is a convention. I give him number and I give him a Bruce number. The number and I go on top through. So this is one plus challenge where I play as church leaders, uh, women's leaders, and the national level. He look him hungry and I need to know Mama. Why na Mama he like him uh, this is a convention? So me play yet ask him question. Maybe this play program, and me one play good play program where all mama he must come kiss him, na line him, na kiss him me go, na only got this play bell angry. The purpose of this convention is to bring women for spiritual enrichment and also train special skills like sewing, cooking, and literacy among others. They will be living on Sunday to Meru village in Kerama for this week-long convention. Arupma, National MTV News.
returning overseas, rescuers are giving up hope of finding survivors from central Italy's powerful earthquake. At least 291 people were killed and the search continues for bodies in the debris. Teams are also working to clear rubble before the ongoing aftershocks cause any more damage and rebuilding can begin. For some communities, the decision is whether to rebuild or not. The grueling work continues for Italian search crews still pulling bodies from the rubble. Whole communities have been shattered by the loss of life and infrastructure. Massimo Perazzi was in the hardest hit town of Amatrice when the earth began to shake. It was my daughter's birthday the day of the quake, he says. We'd organized a party. Five of the girls who were invited were killed in the quake. She had played with some of them the night before the disaster. More than 200 people died in Amatrice alone. Italy's prime minister has vowed to rebuild this ancient town, but some of the smaller villages in this mountainous area may not be so lucky. This is Capricchia, just down the road from Amatrice. Like so many villages in this area, this one's been evacuated after the earthquake, but the residents here face a much more fundamental question, and that is whether they'll ever be able to return to their homes, whether this village will be viable in the future. Rosella Santarelli is one of only 12 residents of Capricchia. She's been staying in this camper van since the quake struck, afraid to enter any building because of frequent aftershocks. I don't think there will be a future, she says. Our village is poor. There are no people and no jobs. Amatrice is five miles away, but there's nothing left of that. As Rosella and the others survey the damage to their houses, Italy has some tough decisions to make. Should villages like this one, with a tiny population in an area prone to earthquakes, be fixed, or is it better and safer to abandon them? There are villages that were already empty before the quake, Rosella says. There are almost no young people anywhere. The towns are old. I think now they will really depopulate. For many tourists, villages like Capricchia epitomize the beauty of the Italian countryside. On top of the horrible human toll this earthquake has caused, in the long run, it may have accelerated the demise of a piece of this country's rich, ancient heritage as well. The world of comedy is mourning the loss of an icon. Gene Wilder, the star of Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, died at the age of 83. This is a look at his unforgettable career. Willy Wonka has left this world. We want to change the world. There's nothing to it. Actor Gene Wilder changed it with his performances, from his Oscar-nominated role in The Producers to his other Oscar-nominated role in Young Frankenstein. Dr. Frankenstein. Frankenstein. You must be Igor. No, it's pronounced Igor. Wilder died at the age of 83 from complications of Alzheimer's, though his nephew said it never stole his ability to recognize those closest to him. There was nothing wild about Wilder in person. He had a sweetness about him even when deflecting a question. Are you asking me if I want to have a baby? I mean, you know, yeah. Well, I'll tell you after the interview. He was an actor who painted watercolors, who married four times. His third wife was SNL favorite Gilda Radner, who got ovarian cancer, even as Wilder himself successfully battled non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And I said, I'll sign right now exchange lifespans with you. The irony is, I meant it. I thought that she'd pull through and that she would live longer than I would. Five years into the marriage, she was gone. Wilder's fourth wife survives him. There's a big hole in comedy's heart with the loss of Gene Wilder, tweeted comedian Larry Wilmore. Wilder blazed his way through Mel Brooks comedies, a hard drinker with a quick draw. No wonder kids liked him. He was an expert in not growing up. A lot of men are babies. To grow up is it's something that comes easier to women. There is no life I know to compare with your imagination. A toast to your imagination, Gene Wilder. You'll live in ours. 
To a bubbly story now, Canadian artist Fen Yang is renowned for his amazing ability to make soap bubbles. He recently presented his amazing bubble show in Expo 2016 in, At in Antalya, Turkey. Fen Yang has earned international acclaim as a result of his complex displays of bubble theatre. In addition to performing, he has developed his own bubble solution formulas and equipment to create bubbles. Fen Yang has broken bubble-related world records on numerous occasions. Truka Sports is next. Don't go away. Tukai Sports. Welcome to True Guys Sports. SP PNG Hunters coach Michael Marum has stuck with the same side that beat the Falcons last weekend. With two players being put on report, Marum will have to make final changes depending on tonight's decision by the QRL judiciary. Stagroth Amin and Adam Karave have been cited for a dangerous tackle and shoulder charge and are waiting decisions from the QRL. Philemon Kimisive may be pushed into Amin's position if the final verdict goes against him. Blanda Bavu has been outstanding over the past few weeks, which sees him maintain the fullback position. Gahuna Silas, after last weekend's performance, has been given the opportunity to start again in the hooker position with Waringle coming off the bench. Wartovo Puara Jr. will try to work his magic in the halves alongside Aceboas to guide the Hunters to the finals. Ahead of the match, Michael Marum has left for Brisbane to attend the annual ISC Awards Night and will return on Thursday. Hunters center Justin Olam has been nominated for two awards, the Rookie of the Year Award and the People's Choice Award. This weekend we'll see Falcons on fifth place take on the Hunters on fourth, while in Townsville, the Blackhawks on third will play Tigers on sixth. Looking ahead, if the Hunters and the Blackhawks win this weekend, the Hunters will travel to Townsville to play the Blackhawks because they finished a place higher on the competition points ladder. But if the Blackhawks lose to East Tigers and the Hunters win this weekend, then PNG will be able to host another knockout final. The loser of both matches from this weekend's match will bow out for the season. Elijah Lavette, National and TV Sports. South Sydney captain Greg Inglis will skipper the Prime Minister's 13 in the traditional match against PNG on September 24 at the National Football Stadium in Port Moresby. Prime Minister's 13 coach Mal Meninga has confirmed that Inglis would play in the annual match and would captain the side. Australian coach Mal Meninga said he would be treating the match as a genuine trial for four nation positions. Maninga spoke highly of his skipper, saying English is an outstanding leader and his selection in the team with the role as captain shows the mindset he has around this game. The nine-time Queensland winning coach and head of Australian national side said he wants to select the strongest team possible and all players who play in the Prime Minister's 13 game will be genuine chances of playing in the Four Nations. Having captained the Rebitos as well as the Indigenous All-Stars this year, English said he was humbled to be given that opportunity to lead the side. Meanwhile, the remainder of the Prime Minister's Tethian team to face PNG in Port Mosby will be selected next month. This is Griffin. He'll be keen to hang on to it if he can this time. Shane Saroya, National MTV Sports. Head coach and team manager for PNG's Taekwondo team to the 2016 Rio Olympics, Edward Kassman, has praised athletes Samantha and Maximilian Kassman for their performances on the international stage. He congratulated the pair, saying their hard work and determination showed clearly in their performances. I think they, um, they both athletes did pretty well, fighting the current world number ones. Um, Considering four months of preparation compared to the other athletes, four years, eight years, um, and the resources we've been given, I think they did pretty well. Uh, on the day, they, they stuck to the game plan. Um, we could not ask for more from them. Um, the refereeing, new equipment, uh, brand new equipment, never tested before outside of the Olympic Games. Uh, you know, we only had two weeks to adjust to that. And so, 
from a coach's perspective and a manager, I think they did uh, everything possible. Eat well, sleep well and fight the best they could. ITI POM Cricket completed its semi-final rounds over the weekend where top five teams in their respective divisions competed for a grand final spot. With all junior division competitions out of the way, POM Cricket will see its reserves grand final this weekend. The women's and premier division will see its grand final on September 10th. In the Premier Division, Swire Shipping Hoods have secured themselves a grand final spot after 14 years of missing out on the finals. Traditional rivals IBS Poroporna and Dulux United will play the decider this weekend. The winner will meet Swire Shipping Hoods in the grand final which is on the 10th of September. Dulux United will be favourites. IBS Poroporna, they sort of uh, picking at the right time. They lost some points early. Um, for not paying the fees on time, but on the field, um, they've been very competitive. So they, they would uh, pose a huge threat to uh, Dulux United taking out the minor premiership. In the women's division, Dulux United entered a fourth grand final in a row with a relatively easy five wicket wins over Swire Shipping Hoods and IBS Poroporna, respectively. Meanwhile, Swire Shipping Hoods have eliminated IBS Logo Who in the first elimination round over the weekend, and for the second elimination this weekend, they will play IBS Poroporna. The winner will take on Dulux United in the Premiership Decider. And in the Reserves Division, IBS Poroporna and Swire Shipping Hoods will meet in the Grand Final. Dini Rose Raiko, National MTV Sports. True Guy Sports continues after the break. Stay tuned. <laughs> Sports. Welcome back. In City Basketball, it was the Flames who took on reigning champions Tamaros in the Port Mosby Men's Basketball League over the weekend. The finals saw the two teams showing great ball handling skills on court to win the match. At full time, it was Flames who controlled a commanding lead over Tamaros, leaving them 91 points behind. MTV's Godwin Eki reports. The grand final match was a hard-fought affair between the two strongest teams in Port Moresby basketball. Both Flames and Tamaros played their final match in front of an energetic crowd who gathered at the Tarama Aquatic Indoor Sports Centre. The match started off on a good note and the two teams didn't waste time to secure points for their teams. Flames managed to push hard off their opponent for the first two quarters of the match but Tamaros held on strongly following the line before they managed to even the scores 52 all at half time. There's a, you know, a grand final team, so we have, three, we have played three series. This one is the first series, uh, so we, uh, we won't take lightly. I think we, uh, we, we prepared well to play this game. Coming back into the full-time playoff, Flames gradually picked up a few points ahead of the Tamaros and continued to carry on with scores every time they had the ball in their hands. The momentum continued for Flames, scoring one after the other, increasing their points on the scoreboard while Tamaros dragged their feet. Confident at leading with points, Flames wasted no time until the full-time whistle, finishing the match with a 120 points victory over Tamaros 91. Godwin Eki, National MTV Sports. Round 6 matches for volleyball and touch footy were played over the weekend at Badili in the Mosby South Electorate. 20 men's teams are taking part in touch footy while another 20 teams in volleyball. Coordinator P.D. John said the tournament is the first of its kind in the area. Youths in Badili played their round 6 matches in both volleyball and touch footy. The youths participated in touch footy for the men and volleyball for the women, all played in the open divisions. <laughs> Tournament coordinator P.D. John said the event is the first of its kind to take place in the area that has brought all the youths together to participate in the event and to keep away from illegal activities. <laughs> So, the competition is due to see finals for both codes take place in September during the long Independence Weekend. Godwin Eki, National MTV Sports. And that ends Chukai Sports. The weather details when we come back. Chukai Sports.
True Kai Sports. The weather details are proudly brought to you by Dulux Weather Shield. Worth doing with Dulux. Your weather forecast for tonight and tomorrow in the southern region, fine although cloudy in Port Mosby and fine in Daru, Kerma, Alotau and Popondeta. In the Mumase region, fine although cloudy in Leh, a shower or two in Vanimo, showers in Medang and fine in Wewak. In the islands region, showers in Loringau and Kavieng, thundery showers in Kokopo, Rabao and Buka and brief showers in Kimbe. And in the highlands region, fine then morning fog in all centers. Strong wind warning current for all coastal waters of southern PNG Indonesia border through Torres Strait and Daru to Kiwa Island to Kerama to Yule Island to Hood Point and all Milne Islands including Cape Vogel to Finchhafen through Vitia Strait, Siasi Islands to Long Island and Karkar Island to Medang to Bogia and Wewek, also West Britain to Manus and Bougainville. Waters of southern PNG Indonesia border through Torres Strait and Daru to Kiwa Island, to Kerama, to Yule Island, to Hood Point, to Samara Island, seas of 2.5 to 3.5 meters. Waters of Eastern and Western Milne Islands with waters of Samara Island to Cape Vogel, to Finchhafen, and with waters of Finchhafen through Vitia Strait, CSC Islands, to Long Island, to Karkar Island, to Medang, to Bogia, to Wewek, seas of 2.5 to 3 meters. Waters west of Wewek to Aitape to Vanimo and northern PNG Indonesia border, seas of 1.5 to 2 meters. Waters of Manus and its western group of islands, seas of 2 to 2.5 meters. Waters of New Island to East New Britain, seas of 0.5 to 1.5 meters. Waters of West New Britain and Bougainville, seas of 2 to 3 meters. Ocean forecast for PNG areas. In the Coral Sea, seas rough with southeast winds at 25 to 34 knots with stronger gusts reaching 48 knots. In the Solomon Sea, seas rough with southeast winds at 25 to 34 knots. In the Bismarck Sea, seas moderate to rough with southeast winds at 20 to 34 knots. And in the Pacific Ocean, seas moderate to rough with northeast to southeast winds at 20 to 34 knots. Weather details are proudly brought to you by Dulux Weather Shield. Worth doing with Dulux. Now before we go, a locally owned ICT company has been given the green light from the National Information and Communications Technology Authority to provide ICT services to remote rural areas in the country. We are Rural Communications Limited, who has been running on an interim license from NICTA and has now been given the approval of three ICT operator licenses. This enables the company to expand their services throughout remote rural areas. According to NICTA, We Are Rural Communications Limited is the first and only rural-based communications company in the country. The NICTA approved licenses to the ICT company are individual network and facility services. This gives the right to install infrastructure for services, individual network or gateway. This is made through using the hub located in the city and individual applications license to provide ICT services. The issued licenses have a span of 15 years. NICTA also clarified that ICT companies must have their own hubs to provide such services. Uh, we note that uh, we are uh, uh, communications uh, uh, were given funding under the uh, uh, government's uh, rural tele telecommunications project through the uh, National Planning Office uh, under a uh, reseller agreement that they have executed with Telecom PNC to provide these uh, services uh, using. Uh, so. 
The issuance of these licenses will also provide more local jobs for the local communities. WRCL Managing Director Anthony Hobuanje says because of the limited access to ICT services in rural areas, the company aims to provide ICT services so that they can have the same services as the urban areas. ICT is an it's a emerging uh, sector and it's a, uh, I would like to encourage people to uh, support be either you know involved in this industry or to support uh, opening companies like us who are in this business so we can be able to work together and develop our country you know basically is to provide service to our remote people you know uh, who need this service there are a lot of things that we can be able to do with ICT you know that's we can do business we can do e-commerce we can support uh, e-health and e-education those are the things that are out there that we can be able to you know, partner with uh, we Are Rural Communications Limited is a newly established ICT service that has been running since 2014. The company has 10 remote sites that are already receiving internet and other services around the country. Marilyn Diaukatam, National, MTV News. Now recapping our main stories for tonight. Duma calls for more specialist workers, Prime Minister in Hawaii for U.S. talks, and visiting New Zealand trade delegation positive. And that's the news, sports and weather for tonight. On behalf of the entire news team, I'm Helen Sayer. Pleasant viewing. Good night.